Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the January webinar for the Lake States Fire Science Consortium. I'm Jack McGunstinsky, and I will be moderating the webinar this afternoon. For those who may be joining us for the first time, let me give you a little background. We are funded by the Joint Fire Science Program and are one of 15 regional consortia for fire science exchanges across the country. Our mission is to accelerate the awareness, understanding, adoption, and sharing of wildland fire science information by federal, tribal, state, local, and private stakeholders across the lake states and the adjacent Canadian provinces of Ontario and Manitoba. We strive to be inclusive and neutral science partners working to foster collaboration among researchers and practitioners and organizations and individuals, and by developing innovative approaches to science delivery while facilitating dialogue about new science findings and emerging needs. Before we get started, let's take a few seconds and look at our Adobe Connect webinar interface. To ask a question or interact with the attendees, please use the chat box located in the lower right-hand portion of your screen. Once you type your question, make sure you click the Send button. We'll be monitoring these questions and we'll make sure that there's an opportunity to address them. For anybody who has joined the audio by phone, I ask that you please hang up and listen through your computer speakers. If you'd like to learn more about the consortium and what we are doing, please visit our website at lakestatesfireside.net and please sign up to receive our newsletters and announcements of other activities. Now on to today's webinar, Strive Fire and Pine Sands, Sea Mortality and the Response of Insects and Pathogens by Steve Katovich. Steve has been a forest entomologist with the U.S. Forest Service Forest Health Protection Unit in St. Paul, Minnesota since 1990. He holds a Ph.D. in entomology from the University of Minnesota and a B.S. degree in forest management from the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. And he is an adjunct faculty member in the Forest Resource Department at the University of Minnesota. Steve has worked most of his career in forest health issues impacting the forest and trees in Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin. So with that, we will hand the webinar over to you, Steve. And I noticed that our chat box like, has disappeared, so I'll get that up and running. But take it away if you want, Steve. OK, thank you, Jack. It's nice to be here, um, a group I don't get to talk to very often. So uh, interesting to talk about fire and insects. I would just mention I did make a minor alteration in the title. I, re I removed the, uh, the, the pathogen part of this. Uh, um, there really was no reference to it in the talk, so uh, I'm going to focus mainly on insects uh, and, and, how, um, and the role that they have in, in fire, uh, fire situations. Again, I am an entomologist by training. Uh, I have a forestry background, so I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in, in uh, how insects interact with trees. Um, so let's get started. I did want to point out this first slide. There are there's actually quite a bit of literature uh, um, that is uh, available on uh, insects and uh, uh, the role in uh, forest fires and trees that have burned, uh, damaged trees from uh, from fire injury. Uh, so. Um, if you're interested in, in some of that literature, I do not cite things as I go along through this talk. Um, so just send me an email later or uh, uh, ask, uh, ask a question and, and uh, I can direct you to that. But again, there is there's quite a bit out there uh, on the entomology end. Uh, when I read some of the uh, fire uh, management related literature, I wasn't seeing much reference at all to insects and that's, that kind of drew my interest. And so. Uh, again, um, uh, just something to be aware of. Uh, there is there is literature out there, and, and uh, I'm just not making all this up. <laughs> okay, so um, some of this uh, <clears throat> kind of generated from a number of site visits that I've made over the year. I, I've been in St. Paul now since 1990, and part of my job is to go out to National Forest Ranger Districts and visit, and a lot of times that means spending a day or two with uh, the local silviculture group and uh, looking at dead and dying trees. It's usually related to insect outbreaks, but over the years it's invariably taken me to a number of uh, prescribed burns or wildfire units, and uh, uh, the questions always come up as to, um, you know, what's going to happen here? What What's going on with the insect populations? Is this tree going to die? Is this a, a problem for surrounding stands? So, again, uh, I've had a lot of interest in this, kind of tried to figure out what's going to go on here. And uh, 
and that kind of raised some questions in my mind. And so uh, this, this, you're seeing a picture of a, a, an older red pine stand, red and white pine stand on the Superior National Forest that I visited a number of years ago. Kind of a classic situation. Uh, the fire got a little hot in places, and uh, the insects very quickly found that and moved in and were causing a, a lot of uh, um, attack uh, in some of these trees. And so there were some questions about what was going to happen. Um, the next situation uh, that, uh, that I'm going to just show you here that, again, raised some questions and popped some interest for me was uh, in a, a younger stand, this uh, red pine plantation on the Chippewa. And um, uh, this had been prescribed burned, uh, suffered some, again, some, some injury, uh, pockets of uh, intense heat damage, dead trees from the fire. Uh, however, there was some persisting mortality going on in this stand two, two years after the fire had occurred uh, related to, it appeared to me, to largely to bark beetles that were, um, again, persisting in this stand and, and causing quite a bit of mortality. And uh, again, uh, kind of thinking about what was going to happen here and, and uh, raise questions uh, for me. I'd like to revisit some of this red pine plantation stuff towards the end uh, as, as kind of a maybe a little issue that uh, we could talk about or think about as to um, are we creating conditions that are uh, conducive to, to some pretty intense uh, insect activity. Um, Okay, so what I'd like to do is, is kind of think about some of the questions I've gotten on some of these site visits and frame this presentation around those questions. I'll try to answer them and, and walk through these, uh, these questions. And uh, again, I think it's worthwhile to do that. It kind of um, uh, allows us a process of thinking about how insects and, and uh, fire damaged trees interact. So uh, the first question we're going to look at is, will insects find and infest fire damaged trees? And, and in other words, are these trees attractive to insects? So that's the question. And um, it's pretty easy to, to look at these trees and, and to see that they are indeed being heavily uh, attacked in some situations by insects. Pine trees killed by fires and many trees damaged by fire are generally infested by a whole array of, of uh, wood boring and uh, wood boring insects and bark beetles. Uh, all you have to do is go back into the, into the burn unit um, uh, a few months after the fire. Uh, and, and in a lot of cases, you can see a lot of evidence of insect attack. Uh, the, the, the large stem on the left side of, of my screen uh, that's all black is uh, you look at the base and in that yellow circle, you're seeing a lot of uh, sawdust at the base of the tree. It's, it's a, a very clear indication that that tree is under attack by wood boring insects and they're just pushing out that sawdust. And so uh, again, very obvious that that tree's under insect attack. Uh, sometimes it's not that easy to tell. Uh, um, the photo to the right, the, the taller, thinner uh, red pine, have a lot of damage at the base of the tree, um, but there's no evidence of insect attack at the base. But if you go up into the mid bowl, that's where all the Ips bark beetle attacks are occurring. So sometimes it, it's not that easy to find uh, insect evidence. Um, I think sometimes those trees take so much injury at the base that the, the, a lot of these insects aren't that interested. The phloem and the cambial tissue has, has been damaged. And, and the, the insect is more interested in, in what's above that. So sometimes you have to look up in the top of the crown or in the mid bowl to see uh, where the insects are actually at. Uh, I'm going to get a little bit more on, on the evidence of insect attack. Uh, I often tell people if you want to find some of these wood borers, you just need a hatchet or a knife and you have to start to pry off the bark. And it's very easy to, to find that these insects are generally interested in the phloem and cambial tissues. So you've got to peel back the bark and not go real deep, and right there you usually will find evidence of uh, bark beetle galleries or, or the initial gallery of a, of a wood uh, uh insect. Um, so again, it's not real hard to find evidence of insect attack in these uh, fire-damaged trees. Um, fire-damaged trees create a signature on the landscape that many insects uh, can perceive and respond to very quickly. Um, 
I think a lot of you probably are aware of this because you've been out on some of these fires and and if you're watching even even as that fire cools down those trees are till, still smoking they're very hot uh, you may notice some of these larger beetles landing on those trees and if you watched real closely you'd see that they're actually probably laying eggs on those trees or mating on those trees and then laying eggs they're, they're they have the ability to detect smoke some of these insects uh, they have the ability, some insects, to detect heat. They have the ability to um, uh, pick up an infrared um, signature in some cases, a few of the beetles. So again, there, there's a very close association between those insects and, and fire uh, in our forests. Uh, they're very interested in trees that have just rapidly been killed, and, and they have the ability to find those, uh, those trees very quickly. Uh, the other thing that goes on once these trees are injured either by a wind damage or a fire is those trees begin to release a lot of alcohols and terpenes and ethanol into the air and a number of our wood boring insects are are very uh, much cued in on on, on, on uh, using those compounds um, to locate to orient and to find trees that that are uh, that are recently damaged um, so again, a big group of insects are, are, are using that to find these trees. And then the other thing is there's a, there's a whole array of uh, attractants occurring with sex pheromones. So it doesn't take very many bark beetles to find uh, injured trees. Those bark beetles, if they're successful in their initial attacks, release pheromone, sex pheromones generally into the air, attractants. And uh, a, a very quickly, a whole they're joined very, uh, by a whole array of of, uh, of additional individuals that are coming in and mass attacking trees. So um, insects again are very uh, um, well adapted at finding these trees and um, in rapidly attacking them. So they're they're very capable of doing that. And here are a couple papers. Uh, they're kind of interesting if you're interested in this. Again, the, the ability of, of some of these insects to use uh, smoke. Uh, they have detectors in their antennae. They, uh, they have infrared uh, uh, detectors on their body in a couple cases with some of these uh, uh, bupressed beetles, um, capable of apparently of, of uh, locating a, a fire on the landscape from miles away and orienting towards it and, and, um, and moving into that area and utilizing those trees. And, and this, this group is uh, actually, uh, the, the group of insects that we're, we're going to talk about is, is very similar to what would come in and attack a lot of other disturbances. Uh, so wind events, this is a, a group, they're not using smoke or heat in this uh, situation, but they're again queuing in on a lot of the the, uh, the other chemicals that are being released by injured or damaged trees. And so um, we can also look at some of the experiences we've had with what's going on with these insects uh, following a wind event or a storm damaged event and answer some of the questions we might have. Because again, it's very similar between, I think, between a wind damage and a fire injury as to what happens in some of these stands. Um, before I go too far, I would I would just mention I, I'm focused mainly on the Upper Great Lakes, and we're talking about pine stands. If if anyone is on here listening from uh, say the Western U.S. or the Southern U.S., uh, there are differences in aggressiveness with some of these insects. I, I I hope to make the point later on that a lot of our insects in this part of the country are are um, are not what I would consider. Um, overly aggressive or capable of attacking and killing healthy trees. We have insects that are generally non-aggressive. They have to utilize trees that have been injured, damaged, that are not real vigorous. And, and that's, that's important to think about here. So our insects up in this part of the country are not uh, capable of killing uh, really healthy trees. If you're in other parts of the country, you may have some other insects that you're going to deal with that, that might cause more injury. So just think about that when I'm giving my examples. Okay, so again, just to uh, kind of generalize this, this first question I asked, uh, many of the stem invading insects are attracted to fire damaged trees. Um, the process can happen very, very quickly. Uh, 
many of these insects can respond during or soon after a fire, after a burn. And so, um, it, again, it can happen as those trees are cooling down uh, right at the end of the fire. You may have beetles visiting them. They want to they want to get there quick. They want to get the, there before their competitors get there. And uh, they want to get there probably why that tree is, uh, is struggling a little bit following that fire. Um, there's a, another question here, though. So obviously, they, they can find those trees. That doesn't necessarily mean that they can successfully infest the damaged trees. OK, that's a, it's another important point. And again, it gets to this idea of aggressive or non-aggressive insects. Um, are they capable of? of uh, infesting a healthy tree, again, generally up here in this part of the, in the country, no. And so um, are they going to be capable of infesting these fire damaged trees? And that's, that's not always a real easy question to answer, but I think it's a, an important thing to think about. And so you got to think about how pine trees defend themselves um, from a stem boring insect. And, and I'm going to simplify this pretty much and just kind of focus in on resin production and res, resin pressure and uh, um, you just think about uh, if you whack a pine tree with a hatchet, what happens? It bleeds sap. Um, and that's basically how these trees are going to defend themselves from an insect that is trying to chew a hole through the bark uh, to gain entry to the cambium or the phloem tissue. So as they, as they chew through that bark, that tree is going to push out resin and, and uh, pitch. And, um, these insects, a lot of them are quite small um, um, at some point in their life cycle. And if they're covered with resin or pitch, they're, they're probably not going to be successful in getting into that tree. Um, so again, the defense on conifers, on pines, is, is uh, I'm, I'm pretty simple, uh, simplified pretty much, but it's, it's largely based on resin uh, pressure and res resin production. So how does a fire impact that in a tree? Uh, can be a really important part of, of this, uh, of what's going on with insects and trees. Um, okay, so dead trees stop resin production. Basically, they're defenseless. They have little or no resin pressure, so these insects are going to be successful in attacking dead trees. And I think you got to think about that a little bit because um, following a fire, if there's some um, damage in the stand, you may have just trees that are killed outright by the fire, right? And, and the insects are going to find those, and they're going to infest those trees. And um, that, OK, so not that big a deal. The tree's going to die either way. However, the, those trees are providing breeding material. You may have more insects coming out than you have coming in. So um, again, dead trees are an important thing to think about because uh, you're, 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 you're creating opportunities for those insects to build populations up in there, and that later on that may cause a problem because sometimes it's just a matter of how many insects there are. Um, if there's enough bark beetles out there, they can sometimes overcome even a health, relatively healthy tree. So you don't want to necessarily generate a lot of these insects uh, in your stands. You, you, you're creating um, a you may be creating a problem by doing that. So dead trees, you have to think about a little bit. The fire-damaged trees um, apparently uh, can have a short-term drop in resin production. Now, I couldn't find a whole lot of uh, evidence for this, but there, is a, there are references that indicate that. So you have a fire, and very quickly following that fire event, there's a short-term drop in, in resin pressure, resin production. So that's maybe a window of opportunity for these insects that are out there. They're arriving quickly, laying eggs. Um, those eggs hatch, or, or maybe they're going to have a bark beetle has to uh, go through the bark and start its gallery. Well, if there's a, a quick drop in resin pressure, those insects can get into those trees and be successful. Um, and again, there's, there's some evidence that this happens. It may be a week or 10 days. It may, may happen uh, for that period of time. And again, those insects are having an opportunity to get in there. So um, that's, that's, a, that's a concern. Over time, if we, if we look at things over 10 to 30 days, it looks like the resin pressure sometimes, or the resin production, uh, actually increases in these trees. Um, so again, a short-term drop and then followed by, in some cases, an increase in resin. 
and, and there's some speculation that this might be an evolutionary trait uh, that pine trees or conifers have in that uh, they know that these insects are going to try to attack. Um, um, and so if you increase resin for a, a while, that, that kind of turns off some of this attack and protects these, these damaged trees um, to some degree. All right. So what happens long term on some of these trees uh, longer than 30 days? So if we go out even further, you know, think about um, what happens. I, you've looked, you look at some of these trees in a burn unit, and they have hardly any crown left. There's been a lot of scorch in the crown, and their crown is up to maybe 10% live crown ratio or 5% live crown ratio. And you start thinking about, uh, can these trees survive? They don't apparently have any insect attack yet, but what's going to happen a year down the road or two years down the road? And, and um, it looks like, in some cases, uh, that the resin production in some of these trees may actually drop after a while. They probably don't have enough foliage um, to cr create enough resources to, to keep that resin up. And so in some of those trees, they may, again, drop resin production and therefore, thereby become uh, more susceptible to beetle attack. And, and uh, that's, that's a concern because we sometimes will look at some of these stands and say, okay, uh, they don't look very good. The trees are hanging on, but, but what's going to happen two or three or four years down the road? And that's a tough question to answer, but uh, this, this may play part of a role there. If they don't have much crown left, um, obviously they, 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 uh, they run a risk of, of um, undergoing attack in the future just because they don't have the defensive ability to defend themselves. How's that? The defensive ability, anyway. All right. Um, just to summarize that, uh, again, dead trees killed outright by a burn, um, they're going to be quickly infested. Uh, not a surprise, but they don't have any ability to defend themselves. You're going to get a lot of beetles built up in there. Uh, that may or may not uh, end up being a problem. Again, our insects aren't super aggressive, but, but, uh, but there's going to be a lot more uh, wood borer activity in that stand for a little while. There's going to be more bark beetles coming on. Uh, there are damaged trees, and um, fire injury can can impact resin flow, which does have a direct effect on stem boring insects. And so, yeah, it looks like fire damage can compromise uh, trees that were once healthy and have have damage. So what that means, it, it can be tough to say, but it, you know, we, we can't ignore the fact that you've injured that tree, uh, you've impacted the crown ratio, and you've probably made that tree more susceptible to uh, future uh, uh, attack by, by an insect. Um, it seems very likely that, uh, that insects can successfully infest fire-damaged trees. Uh, though this may depend upon a whole array of different things. And, and, and it's interesting because when you visit these sites, I'm sure a lot of you have noticed this, you can have one burn unit um, that doesn't have much insect activity in it. Um, maybe it was burned a month earlier or something is a little different. The fuel loads were different. Uh, you go over to a neighboring burn unit and there's all sorts of insect activity. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of different uh, things that can that can play a role here, but it, it um, you know, we, we do need to pay attention, I think, to what insects, uh, the role that some of these uh, wood borers and bark beetles can play in these, in these units. They are quite capable of, of finding and infesting these trees. Okay, so let's uh, go to the second question. And um, uh, again, I, in my mind, I, I kind of like like doing this is just kind of framing up my thoughts here. Are insects contributing to the mortality, or are they simply utilizing trees killed by the fire? Um, you know, you visit these sites and you look at a tree, and okay, um, it, the tree still got green needles up in the crown. Uh, maybe it doesn't look that great. There's a lot of stem scorch, and the insects are in that tree. Bark beetles or wood borers are active in it. And, and so um, the question is, 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 if those insects are, were not here, if the tree was not under insect attack, would the tree survive? It, maybe it would. Maybe it wouldn't. Maybe it would just die a year later from the injury that the fire um, um, 
had on the tree. And so it's hard to sort out what role the insects are playing sometimes. Um, but I think if we just kind of look at these insects and, and, and kind of generalize about the group of insects that we're talking about, maybe we can get somewhere with this, uh, this topic. Uh, so real quickly, I want to just walk through the, the insects that, that uh, we generally see on fires and, and then just talk a little bit about them. Um, are they a, a concern or are they not really that big of a deal? So you have the longhorn beetles. You have the metallic wood borers, uh, the bark beetles, and, and up here it's generally going to be ips, ips species. And then you'll have a, another bark beetle, but a little more specialized in the turpentine beetle. So I'll just walk through these a little bit. And, and again, the longhorn beetles, this is the large, some of these tend to be very large insects, uh, long antenna. They're going to come in on these. Uh, these, these damaged trees, very large larvae in some of the species. They, they are deep wood borers uh, after they get going a while in these trees. Uh, very common in, in our pine uh, stands uh, a year or two uh, after, uh, after a fire. You see a lot of evidence. This is the group that if you sit out on a burn on a nice warm day in the summer, you can hear these, uh, the, the immatures uh, chewing inside the trees. Uh, um, again, a, a, a common group. Uh, they're generally infesting dead trees or trees on the verge of dying. So again, they're, they're very much a secondary group, I think. Um, they're not normally considered a threat to living trees. Uh, they have long life cycles, so it's, it's hard for them to respond numerically to a fire. They can't really build up big numbers real quickly and take advantage of a lot of weakened trees. So I think of this group as, as generally not a real threat to cause a lot of additional mortality in these stands and, and to be a real big problem. So um, uh, again, kind of a secondary group. Uh, easy to tell if you've got a lot of this activity. They, they, they tend to push out a lot of sawdust when they're, when they're working in the trees. Um, um, it tends to be a larger, uh, more fibrous uh, uh, material than the bark beetles. Um, and again, you can see it sometimes at the base of these trees and, and have some idea if the tree is under, under attack. Um, you can also find egg niches that are chewed into the bark. Uh, this is kind of a triangular, rough little uh, pit that's been chewed into the bark, and that's where the female beetle chewed and then laid an egg in there. So those are very diagnostic for, for the longhorn beetles. They're going to be all over these trees. Um, and, and, and again, somebody might get concerned about that, but again, generally I would say they're not a threat to, uh, to killing a lot of the, uh, the borderline healthy trees and, and the trees that are um, outside the burn unit. Then you have the metallic wood borers. These, these beetles tend to look like bullets. Um, uh, they're, they're kind of metallic looking, shiny. Um, uh, the, the larval stage would be called a flat-headed wood borer. It looks like it's been kind of stepped on or compressed up on the, the head end. Uh, they tend to, f to the larval stages feed just under the bark in the, in the phloem and cambium, so they're not one that's going to dive deep down into the wood. Again, very, very common. This is the group that some of these have the ability to, to detect infrared um, signatures that would come in on these burned trees. So again, another group that I would consider very much secondary, and uh, um, they're attacking the dead trees or the trees just on the verge of dying, not considered a threat to living trees. So again, very common, but, but a group I wouldn't get too concerned about. Uh, they have long life cycles, again, and it's, it's hard for them to respond quickly to, uh, to a, a fire. Then you have the bark beetles, and in our case, it's going to be ips the yip species generally. Uh, you can see the gallery over on the left. The, the, if you get sawdust, it tends to be more of a fine, uh, powdery sawdust. Um, um, you'll see exit holes if you've been out, if it, it's been out there for a little while. Uh, the adults are very diagnostic. They, they have that uh, um, end of the body that is, is got the, the uh, little spikes on it. Uh, so again, ips pinei, very common up here. Uh, this is actually a relatively um, uh, not not again not an aggressive bark beetle by any means. It's it it is capable, however, of killing uh, 
trees that are undergoing stress and that are, are weakened to some degree. And this is the one that you'd probably see in these stands that could is capable of building up pretty high populations quickly because they can run through two or three generations in a year up in, in northern Minnesota or northern Wisconsin. Um, and you can get population increases. And again, they are, uh, they are the ones that would probably uh, be mainly responsible for prolonging tree mortality in some of these burn units. Okay, so that's the, that's the group that I would be most concerned about. Uh, turpentine beetles are an, another bark beetle, and I, I, I wanted to show this one because they're very common in, in burns. Uh, if you look at the base of these trees, uh, you often see a popcorn-like uh, pitch tube. It, may, uh, it would only usually go up to about your knee uh, in height. Uh, they're, they're attacking right at the ground level or up a little bit. And, and um, th again, they're common. And, and they, I think they can cause additional stress in a lot of these trees. Um, they, they have uh, kind of a cave gallery. It's different than a lot of the bark beetle galleries. They're creating kind of small pockets of dead phloem and cambial tissue uh, right underneath the bark at the base of the tree. And, and sometimes you can have a whole lot of attacks, and sometimes you may only have one or two of these. Um, but if you look in a burn and you see a lot of this activity, to me it's just indicating that, hey, this, is, uh, this hasn't kind of cleaned up yet. You're going to have additional um, injury going on in these trees, and, and something may pop up that's persisting here. And, and again, not an insect that's going to kill trees outright, but one that's just going to kind of cause you additional stress. And, and not a good sign to see a lot of this, um, but, but um, um, a, a one or two attacks on a tree I wouldn't get too concerned about. You may see turpentine beetle attack for a little while, and then it kind of fades away. And, and uh, a few years after the burn, it may be completely gone. And if it's persisting two, three, four years afterwards, then, then I think you have a, it's a good indication that you have a lot of trees that are under stress and not doing real well. OK, so fires can create conditions very favorable to, to this group of insects. Um, uh, but again, most of these insects um, are not real aggressive and are not going to cause a lot of additional problems for you. Um, the one I would be a little bit concerned about is, is, is its pine eye, and that's, they're capable of, of uh, uh, re-attacking uh, trees, attacking trees that are um, you know, two or three years after a burn are still having problems, uh, a, a little ha struggling with recovery after the fire. Um, so in the lake states, generally the group is not aggressive, unlikely to kill healthy and vigorous trees. And I think a fire manager has to think about those two words at the end there, healthy and vigorous. Do we have healthy, vigorous trees, or do we have trees that are still struggling from, the, from injury from fire? And if that's the case, then you may have additional insect problems um, in those stands. Okay, so that's that's kind of the summary of that question. Um, I'm going to go quicker on this one. So will insect populations build and fire damaged trees and threaten nearby trees and nearby stands? Again, this is a question I've frequently gotten, and I got this one when I was up on the Superior in that older white pine stand, white pine, red pine area that had burned. There was a private landowner right next door that was concerned that uh, the fire unit was generating so many of these wood boring insects that they would then come over on their property and attack their trees. And, um, you know, I don't think that's going to happen very often. Uh, what, and I go back to a lot of the, uh, what I've seen in some of the wind damage stands, um, uh, as well as the fire units, that the, we have seen insects build up, and generally it's, it's bark beetles again, and, and attack trees that are close uh, in the same stand and probably already have some existing damage. But we have not seen up in this part of the, of the lake states anywhere, anyway, um, these insect populations building up in a fire unit and then or in a windstorm unit, and then moving over and damaging nearby stands or moving across the landscape and causing outbreaks 
uh, that are damaging our stands outside. So the damage seems to persist or be focused uh, close, uh, close in, and uh, and again not not expanding outwards. And I think that's kind of again important to think about that uh, if you have a fire that got a little hot, caused some injury, it's probably not going to generate enough insects that it's going to cause a problem outside the unit. Um, but in the unit, you may have persistent problems for a little while from insects. Uh, and again, generally that will be probably related to bark beetles. All right. So I want to – probably going really fast uh, – I want to kind of come back to something here. And it's easy for me to say, could this have been avoided? In reality, the – I think the answer to this is, is uh, pretty easy. Um, obviously, things can be avoided. I don't, I'm not a fire manager. I know it's probably very difficult uh, to avoid injury and damage to trees, but in reality, I think that's pretty much the answer to a lot of this. If you minimize damage, um, you minimize the number of trees that are killed, the, minimize the number of trees that have significant crown scorch, the minimize the number of trees that have significant stem scorch, you're you're going to reduce the amount of insect activity, and and so it, it you know it's that easy to say, but I'm sure it's hard to accomplish in the field. But I I want to I want to um, talk about one situation that I, I think you know we uh, probably needs to be thought about or addressed a little bit as to how much uh, injury or damage uh, some of these stands are taking and uh, what's going on in them, and and I'd like to focus again in on some younger red pine plantations. Um, and because uh, I want to do that because I visited a few of these sites, and, and again, this is often where I've seen some persistent insect uh, uh, mortality occurring. Uh, what I would say, you're actually getting past the point where it's just mortality that was caused by the fire, but you're actually getting trees that are being killed uh, because the insect populations have built up. and, and uh, and, our, and, and the beetles are actually uh, contributing to mortality in some of these plantation situations. And uh, this the, go back to this one site on the Chippewa that I visited. Um, uh, the tree mortality in here is lingering. And, and the one time I was in there, it was about two or three years after the burn. Um, uh, the trees, a lot of trees had the, the beetles had come in, infested them. A lot of these trees probably would have died with or without the beetles within a year or so. But again, two or three years later, you're still seeing. See if I can figure out how to use this pointer. So this tree over here, I'm circling uh, in the background, has red needles. It's an actively dying uh, tree that's infested with Ips pinei and probably other insects as well. Um, there were also in this, there were several of these trees in this stand um, it, uh, th that had red needles. They had just recently died. Uh, there were additional trees that were basically kind of yellow, off-color yellow, and those trees uh, probably would be turning red within a few weeks of my visit. And they, they were just indicative of active bark beetle activity. This, this stand had bark beetles active in it uh, two years after the fire had occurred. And, and so something was going on there, and it was kind of persisting. It was a little different than, than what we, you normally see. And, um, um, you know, in my opinion, you looked at this stand, and one thing that caught my attention was uh, it was a pretty young stand to have a fire in it. Um, and so that, that kind of raised some, some questions for me and, and some issues. Um, again, a, a relatively young plantation. Uh, I think it was yet less than 50 years old. Uh, the level of tree damage and insect response uh, really probably, I, I would say, I guess when I was out there, it's like, well, I'm not sure what you're surprised by, if anything. It's, it's uh, when you cause um, injury to, 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 to a lot of the trees, uh, you, again, as we've talked about here, uh, the insects are going to find these trees and are going to sometimes persist in some of these stands if you have enough injury. Uh, and that's what was occurring here. And I kind of went back to the office and I, I, I started reading um, some more stuff, not in the entomology literature, but just the, the kind of fire red pine literature. And, and uh, 
you know, I was kind of struck by the fact that a lot of this stuff, uh, they talked about how to, how to um, judge the amount of mortality you know, based on stem scorch and on crown, crown injury, crown scorch, but they, they rarely, if ever, uh, had any uh, um, reference to insects. So they, they, ne they didn't, they just totally ignored insects. So as an entomologist, I, I felt kind of bad about that. But it was, it was kind of interesting to me because I really think when I go into those stands or when I've been taken in there, uh, it's because there is a, a lot of insect activity that's occurring. And, and so it was like, wow, you just can't ignore this. They, they may be playing a role in, in what, how long that mortality uh, persists for or how much you have. Um, and, and then the other thing that, I, that caught my attention was this idea that there's generally, and I've heard this before, that there's a perception that red pine um, are very, red pine trees are very tolerant of fire. And when I read this, uh, this liter a lot of these papers, it, you know, there were statements about uh, the well-documented tolerance of red pine to fire. And, and, you know, I kind of wondered about that because I read, uh, I read uh, the, the Van Wagner uh, paper, which seemed to be very widely cited, it's from 1970. And when I read it, it was just like popping up red flags to me. Um, um, again, basically talking about the flammability of red pine plant stands, especially plantations. Um, uh, and the, uh, the, the fact that a lot of these trees, up to about the age 50, uh, this generalizing age 50 are not very capable of handling a fire, apparently, from what I, I could read in, in, in this paper. And it's, it just was a disconnect between what I'd been reading about how tolerant these trees were to fire and the fact that this paper seemed to be saying that you better be very, very careful about burning um, in younger red pine stands and especially in plantations. And, and I've been uh, seeing on a number of uh, you know, uh, sites on the lake states here where it seemed like fire was being pushed uh, into younger and younger plantations. And I think, again, what's that, what that sets up is, is uh, lots of damage in some situations, a lot of injured trees, uh, dead trees in some places. And again, that's just kind of uh, being compounded by insect activity that's following in on that. So. Um, I think one of the ways that a lot of this could be avoided is to, to rethink that, that process. I, I don't like to come off anti-fire, but are we uh, making good management decisions when we're putting fire into uh, what Van Wagner seems to think a very risky situation? And um, if you're causing a lot of injury uh, in these younger plantations, you're just setting them up for uh, future damage um, from, from insects. Uh, and I think that's that's something we we you all ought to think about. Uh, um, so anyway, that's that's basically um, where I'm going to end this thing. Uh, uh, again, a lot of these insects are dependent on dead, dying, and stressed trees. And if you can limit uh, significant crown scorch, limit stem damage, you're probably going to limit. Uh, the, um, the amount of activity that you have from insects, and most of the time that's going to be beneficial to you long term. Um, um, and as I said earlier, even if you do get a lot of insect activity in some of these stands, that doesn't mean it's the end of the world. In our area, they're not super aggressive. And most of the time, you shouldn't see a lot of additional mortality from these insects. But um, if, if, uh, you know, if we don't do things right, it is a group that can come up and, and hit you and cause a lot and cause some additional mortality in places. Okay, Jack, I think that's, uh, I'm going to open it up and um, answer any questions if there are any. Okay, sure. Um, remember folks, type your questions in the chat box and we do have one from Matt Tyler. Um, he's asking, to summarize, is it correct to say that minor damage may increase defenses in medium term, but major crown scorch makes trees vulnerable? Well, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, <laughs> I think it's probably, uh, we, especially when you're saying major crown scorch, um, 
you know, the word major may mean different things to different people. I think that's part of the problem here. But, you know, there is some evidence um, uh, that uh, significant crown scorch over time uh, can drop resin production. So, um, you know, if, if you think about it, if a tree doesn't have many needles, it's, it's going to struggle. And, and if it's struggling, it's, it's in my mind, going to be, a, just to simplify this whole thing, it's going to be susceptible to more, uh, to more health issues. So, um, yeah, I mean, but again, that's, that's simplifying things on that answer. Um, okay. Um, let's see. Paul McNellis just asked, thoughts on injections of uh, systemic insecticide as a preventative? Uh, you know, I, uh, if we're talking about, no, I, well, first of all, in, in, a, in a larger stand, I, I don't know how you would accomplish that. Um, um, you may have problems with systemics being moving through these trees because if they took some type of cambial or phloem tissue damage, uh, um, uh, it may be a problematic for the product to even move. So it's, it's probably not something that we could even try to accomplish. Um, uh, if there was just an individual tree, however, I, I guess I'm not real comfortable answering this question. Maybe somebody else in, in the group could, but if you had an individual tree that was really high value and it uh, had, had some scorch and crown damage and you were worried about it from, a, from an insect attack, I suppose you could perhaps consider uh, protecting it with an insecticide. If an injection would be the appropriate way to go, I don't know. Uh, probably. You know, I might think about just a surface bark applied protectant for a couple of years or something, but um, it just doesn't seem very practical to think about injecting uh, trees on a large scale. Okay. I'll give it a few more minutes for any additional questions. See if anybody has more. Okay, so I see I see a really nice comment from Jessica there. I think Jessica, you should send me your address, and we'll get you some little thank you note. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. Yeah, we get a few other people typing in. Um, now, yeah. While we're waiting for those, I got a question. I mean, um, and I don't know that he can answer it now, but it's more of um, kind of a comparison of, of overall mortality uh, rates. Uh, fire versus, because you mentioned wind, you see a lot of the same in, insect damage from, or insect uh, following wind damage, relates to maybe where there hasn't been a disturbance. So it's kind of a comparison of, you know, is there actually a, a noticeable increase in mortality related to these disturbance factors? Well, you know, again, a lot of it is just scale. I think um, some of the wind events we've had are, have been very large, uh, you know, the blowdown in the Boundary Waters uh, area, um, Itasca, um, uh, some of the wind events. Uh, so, um, you know, we have seen some bark beetle wood borer issues in, in, in those uh, areas. Um, but it's hard to compare because again we have we we have trees that are basically snapped off completely, um, broken, partially damaged, and it's 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 really hard to compare uh, the 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 amount of injury that each of those trees are taking. Or a lot of the winds. What we see in a lot of the wind events is the trees that are inside the wind area. Um, Oftentimes, if you watch them, there was a study that Kamal Gandhi uh, was a grad student here at the University of Minnesota. She watched a lot of trees up in the big blowdown up in northern Minnesota there, the, the Boundary Waters uh, wind event. And she tracked a lot of the stuff over time. And what we found is those trees actually, uh, if they had some damage, if they were uh, bent or twisted or leaning, they eventually died from and they were infested by beetles but a lot of times they also just failed so you had trees that were still alive they were hanging in there for a few years 
Um, but over time, they, they just kind of, a lot of times they fell over uh, from other wind events, and the insects were playing a role in there. Um, but I'm kind of rambling right now. But, but, but again, I think, um, I think the wind events have been, been hard, uh, a little more insect-related injuries occurred, it's, but it hasn't blown out. I think the point I, I wanted to make here in this part of the, in the United States, we have not seen our bark beetles or whatever build up in those damaged stands, be it fire or wind or whatever, and then blow out and go across the landscape and be a threat to our other stands uh, that are in the area. Um, that, okay. that just hasn't happened. Um, um, so I just went into that event. Um, that kind of leads into um, John asked another question here, which I was thinking of too. And his question is: Any evidence that red pines that are consistently exposed to fire, so those you know that survive the first event, do they do they behave differently to insect attack or attraction than stands which have never been challenged by fire? And he says that is: you know, Does long-term fire exposure chemically change the wood? And its attractiveness or vulnerability to bugs and crud. Bugs, yeah, you know, um, <laughs> that's a tough question. I can't, I can't answer that, John. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I, I we don't have uh, um, um, our, our, um, the defensive system of trees. Um, is different than ours. I mean, we're not building up antibodies or anything like. I, I I don't know, but you know, as trees age, as pine, as these red pines age, obviously their bark um, thickness is changing. Um, there's there's things going on um, that are making them more resistant. If uh, if they've been, but, you know, the other thing is. I didn't talk about, and you you know, you, many of you have probably seen this. You get fire scars um, that can cause you know, that can play a role in, in, in the long-term health of these trees or how they respond. But if, you, if a tree, if these, some of these stands have, have, um, have had repeated burns, and especially if they've had some that have been hot and you've had areas of uh, damage at the base and they've had fire scars forming, that, that, that can play a role. Um, and, and I don't really know how to address that other than to say, you know, I task a, um, um, they've seen, um, the fire scars play play a problem um, uh, on some of their prescribed burn units, and it, it's some of it's just outright fire injury that gets in there and burns out the, the center of the tree. But sometimes you also, um, after the burn, get some bark beetle activity around around those um, those fire scars, and then make it larger and, and kind of uh, over time that th those injuries can can kind of build up. So again, not a question I'm answering very well, but but uh, um, I think uh, you know repeated fires can be a problem if if you're getting that that low grade injury. Uh, but I'm not sure there's any resistance that's built up within the tree itself. Uh, I, I don't think um, again that's that's likely to happen. But you know maybe somebody else has something to add there. Okay. I'm seeing quite a few people are typing. I'm not sure if it's they're doing private chats or if they're typing up questions, so let's give it a few. There we go. Um, Adele asks, in those trees that increased resin production following fire, would there be a permanent increase in resin in those annual ring predating the fire that would make the tree more resistant to decay or wood boring insects or carpenters or wait a minute, or carpenter ants? Uh, you know, I, I Again, a question I can't answer. I, I really don't know how to answer that. I, um, um, okay. you, you know, I, I would lean to no, but but again, I, I'm not I'm not capable of answering that question. Okay. Um, Mark Chermack asked a question. I was thinking of too. It's thinking about fire timing or seasonality. Yeah. 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 I. We'll okay. See that. Um, you know, I, I thought about putting a timing, and this is an important issue because, again, you got to remember that timing um, is, is important. I'm sure from the tree perspective, uh, um, you know, um, what's what's uh, is the tree broken bud? Um, what's the physiological state of the tree as to when the uh, the fire occurs? But also from the insect standpoint, um, 
so a lot of those so a lot of these insects if, if the fire is an example occurs really early in the spring we may not even have activity um, from ips bark beetles they, they become active pretty early in the spring but they they overwinter on the forest floor um, and they don't really get cracking until mid-May around this part of Minnesota and maybe up in the northern Minnesota and maybe even later than that. So if you're burning, and the, and the other wood borers may not even be out as adults until mid-summer to late summer. So if you're burning at certain times of the year, you may not have many insects active uh, that can come in there and quickly attack those trees. Um, so that's something to think about. Not really sure, you know, what how that interacts here. And again, I did mention that sometimes you see a one unit next to another unit um, and there's no damage in one and there's a lot of damage in another and, and that, that that may all play there's a lot of subtlety here on when when did the the fire occur um, what was the local insect population like maybe you had some wind damage nearby and so you had a lot of wood borers and bark beetles in the area um, so timing and, and local populations could be playing a really important role and it makes it hard to predict what's going to happen. Um. All right. Um, and Tim had a comment there, um, noticing that a lot of the reptile stands in the pictures are overstocked, um, so the insects may intensify the, the mortality based off that increased fuel loading. Yeah, yeah, I would say that the, the one red pine plantation, um, you know, some of these are, again they're burning in these pine plantations and. Again, I'm not, but but fuel loads obviously how hot these fires get. They I think they had thinned this one before uh, burning it, so there was there had to be you know more fuel on the ground. It, so again, there's a lot of different things there, and I, all I'm telling you maybe you think about this. <laughs> it's really pretty simple. But the more injury, the more damage those trees take. I would think as a generally as a generally safe thing for me to say is that. Uh, the more injury, the more damage, the more likelihood they're going to be susceptible to uh, to further insect attack. Uh, again, it's a generalization. So a fire manager, you know, no different than any other time, if you can minimize that, it's, it's got to be helpful, I think, from a from an insect perspective, insect management perspective, I should say. Correct. Okay. We'll give a few more minutes if there's any additional questions. And one more I had, I mean, you were mentioning, uh, you had alluded to scale, um, whether it's, again, fire or uh, wind throw. Um, any thoughts on that? I mean, the size or the acreage that's impacted, if that has any influence on, on insect mortality? <laughs> you know, I, 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 I really don't know. I mean, it, you, um, yeah, I don't know how to answer that. I mean, you you have, yeah, I, I don't know where to go with that one. You can have, you could, I guess you could have a fire of such large scale that, um, you know, you don't have enough insects to to utilize all that material. Uh, it, it may take them a while. We see that sometimes with storm events or wind events. You, you know, it takes there's the stuff that's broken down and snapped. They get in there first, uh, and then they kind of build up. And it, take, it can take them two, three, four years to really get their population uh, built up. Um, uh, and then generally they fall apart because at that point there's just not much left for them to attack. But, but again, if you had a really big fire, I suppose there's so much material. There's not enough insects out there to really... Um, I, I'm just, again. I, I don't know where to go with that, Jack. I, it's 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 un sure. unclear to me to for what that you know where, what that really means. I think even in a small area, though, you can have um, you can build up populations and and, and have a problem in the, in a couple acres. Uh, you can have a problem in a 10 acre stand, a 50 acre stand. Um, um, sure. Okay. Yeah. I'll give it just a few more minutes, see if any <clears throat> more questions um, come in. I'm going to um, start wrapping this up. And, and so if anybody has any um, additional questions, please type them in, and we'll get to them. Um, while we're waiting, again, I'd like to thank you, Steve, and everyone online for joining us this afternoon. Um, if you want to review this webinar or share it with someone else um, that might be interested to, to 
see it, I will have a recording of this webinar up on the Lake States Fire Science Consortium website later this afternoon. Um, and then let me go to the next slide. Um, we actually have a webinar next week. This was originally scheduled for December, but we rescheduled it to next week. Um, so it's uh, January, 20, January 25th, next Thursday. Um, note the time, though. Uh, this one will be held at 11 a.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Central. And this is where we're going to go over our three funded interim projects from 2017. And you can see the uh, three topics that will be covered in that. Um, I think that's it, then. I don't see any more questions, so why don't we go ahead and wrap this up. So again, Steve, thank you so much, and thanks everyone for participating, and have a good rest of the day. Yeah, thanks, Jack. Sure.